Thanks very much indeed. Uh, and it's a great pleasure always uh, to talk to people who are conservation minded, uh, which I certainly am, as, as you'll pick up as I go through this presentation. So I'm going to start with, uh, first of all, an introduction to myself. Uh, this is a second career for me. I started life in the Royal Air Force and I spent 37 years there. I was a Topman instructor and then went on to a high level policy work, which is the penalty for having a lot of good uh, fun uh, flying. Uh, but these days and for the last uh, more than 10 years now, I've been mainly working underwater. Uh, I'm a former chairman of the British Society of Underwater Photographers. I've published uh, a couple of books uh, and written for a lot of magazines, uh, some of which I'm sure you'll recognise, and a few of them are here. Um, and I used to have a column in uh, a magazine and I've been published in all of the UK uh, broadsheets. I'm a fellow of the Royal Photographic Society, and that was specifically, uh, it's the, the highest accolade they award to uh, photographers. And that was specifically for a project I did on bat photography, which I will talk about uh, later on. And I, uh, although it's probably not too popular to talk about Royal Mail at the moment for reasons most of you uh, will know about, I'm still very proud nevertheless uh, to have one of my images from a chalk stream on a first class stamp. Uh, that was part of a set of river wildlife images and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you more about that later if you haven't seen them. But my life in this world started, uh, um, well it started in the year 2000 really when I started diving, I was still in uniform at the time, but became fascinated as most people do when they go underwater with the underwater world. Uh, but rapidly uh, hearing what was going on, seeing the good and the bad, uh, it was pretty obvious to me uh, that um, I might be in a position to do something about this because I was pretty handy with a camera. I absolutely loved diving. And as soon as I stepped out of uniform, I was uh, already prepared uh, to go into this world. And what I thought I could add a lot of value to uh, were marine protected areas, because I know these work particularly well. And this image here is a very important one for me. I took this in a place called Misul in Indonesia. And for those that don't know the location, uh, this was one of those areas that had been absolutely trashed by human activity. So there was cyanide fishing, dynamite fishing, uh, bottom dredging, trawling. They were just depleting all the fish stocks. It was a shark finning station. So they were slaughtering the sharks to the extent that there were none left in this particular area. And somebody had the foresight as, as all these people moved on after they'd really wrecked this bit of the ocean. Somebody thought, well, let's try and protect it and see if we can get it back to what it was. And lo and behold, uh, nature does work incredibly well when it's left alone. And 10 years later, this has become an extraordinary uh, place. Uh, the corals have grown back uh, where they were destroyed. The fish stocks are utterly abundant. I haven't got time to show you the video and photos from all of it, but I just want to point out it's a huge success story. The manta rays are back, the sharks back, uh, top predators are back and everything is back in balance. And uh, it is protected very, very fiercely. And that's the point you don't just need uh, really the legal instruments. Uh, that's one thing in creating a marine protected area, but you then need to protect and nurture it. And this particular place do it exceptionally well. And it's now a very high end, true eco resort. Uh, and and uh, a lot of people try and badge things as eco, but this is done really, really well. And I've never dived in such a great place. And it inspired me to really uh, get involved in marine protected areas because they work. And I, I'll tell you just very briefly about two uh, that I was involved in because this eventually led me to uh, rivers and generally in chalk streams in particular. I worked with uh, Fauna and Flora International. They gave me a major commission uh, in uh, Cambodia. They wanted to create a marine protected area and I had to document for them the habit, three habitats, uh, coral reefs, the mangroves and seagrass and, and all of those habitats are very, very important. And I'm just showing one slide here, but the, the images were very, very widely used, including in a pitch to the Cambodian government to create a marine protected area and it worked and they now have a marine protected area where things were really on the edge that were starting to be destroyed. Uh, particularly by the fishing and, and the commercial interests there. So now it has protection and I'd love to go back there in 10 years 
and see if it's restored to the extent that Lazul was. And the one other major project I've been, been involved in is uh, Ascension Island, where the British government uh, a little while ago created uh, what is now the biggest marine protected area in the Atlantic Ocean. And I was lucky that whilst I was still in uniform and uh, I was uh, teaching people uh, to dive at the time and taking people on adventurous training trips to improve their leadership skills. But I was taking images while I was there and some of these uh, images proved to be very, very valuable to the Blue Marine Foundation who I worked with, who I still work with. Uh, and uh, they even ended up on the uh, front page of most of their publicity material, this particular image shown here. But they also created this marine protected area, and this is doing incredibly well now. It's also being well pr protected and it's huge. And uh, it, it just has extraordinary fish stocks around there um, of all kinds. So I, I'm a great believer in marine protected areas. Uh, overfishing, it's not just the pollution thing, not just the plastic. It is overfishing as well. And having these little areas of protected water is incredibly important. But of course, the important point is leading on to chalk streams, it's all connected and uh, rivers are connected to oceans. And therefore, when you start looking at what's happening in uh, rivers, uh, and I've taken images, uh, you know, from the seashore to the deep ocean and through to rivers, uh, then it's rapidly apparent, uh, you, you know, we've, we've got to look after the whole lot. So these are um, grayling from a, a beautiful tributary of the River Test, the Anton, for those that know it. And uh, I've had uh, stand up arguments with Thames Water on the banks of the Anton uh, because they were putting up signs just saying uh, very in a very, I don't know, dressed up way. They're about to pour raw sewage into the area exactly where I was uh, taking photographs at the time. And on the left, some of you may uh, recognize the, uh, the sewage map from the Rivers Trust there. And I've done a lot of work with the Rivers Trust. And it's quite horrific. Uh, I think uh, many of you will know what is going on with our rivers at the moment. And it's really one of those unacceptable faces of capitalism where money's just been put ahead and profit has been put ahead of just about everything, including uh, the uh, cleanliness of these beautiful rivers. So I, uh, for this bit of work, adopt, uh, adopted the badge, uh, the Riverman. Uh, and I'll start with a really good story because we, we, we know a lot about the uh, bad. Uh, I'll call it the little monsters, uh, but I was doing some work for the Rivers uh, Trust at the time uh, on the Anton. And traditionally, when I'm diving uh, in the water, in the ocean, this is the sort of rig I would use. And I do use it occasionally on rivers, but I'll show you later that I've developed better rigs for taking underwater photos in rivers, because when you use do this sort of photography, you're interacting with the environment. And because you're always touching uh, the river bed, uh, you're not always being particularly helpful. It's also very, very cold, usually a constant 10 degrees. Uh, so you can't stand much time in the water, or I certainly can't at the uh, age I am now. Uh, and also fish, river fish are skittish. So, uh, you know, you'd have to sit there for a long time before they come back to the camera. So th there are better ways of doing it, but I have been on the Anton doing this kind of work. And to bring the fish to the camera, I'll normally use uh, a little bit of food in the form of high uh, protein pellets uh, to try and get the fish uh, close to the camera. And it's essential for good quality underwater imagery. But of course, uh, ducks, as soon as they see you putting food in the water, uh, they come racing at you. And this little group of uh, gorgeous mallard uh, ducks uh, decided to adopt me uh, during this project, which I thought was great fun to start with. And a colleague from the Rivers uh, Trust took this particular picture. But of course, I was creating monsters for myself here because wherever I then went, these ducks would follow me around. And every time I then uh, went down to the water to try and photograph the grayling or the trout, uh, they were pecking at my hands, pecking at my head even, until I'd give them more food. So I really did create a problem for myself, but uh, sometimes you've just got to roll with it. Uh, and I did get some super images that owned one of them became uh, a pretty good award winner uh, because it does show these uh, beautiful creatures in their environment and they're part of it. But these, uh, this little group of ducks actually followed me around for a week. Uh, they almost, uh, I think I became imprinted in a way that the mother was there looking after them, but she kept her distance. She knew that they worked out how to get a good, uh, uh, some good food. And even at the end of the day, as I walked to the car, they'd follow me uh, right to the car park and stand by the car until they got the last scrap of food from me. And they'd meet, the, uh, meet me the following morning as well. 
but beautiful little creatures. And although I found them hugely irritating while I was trying to do the work to start with, uh, you just got to love uh, a little duckling. And that's probably my favourite photo of them. If any of you have been there on River Ant the River Anton at uh, Goodworth Clatford, uh, that's the bridge that goes over there. But whilst I was photographing these ducks, uh, the, this swan came along. And uh, swans, uh, it seems to me, are quite vain because it wanted every feather in place uh, before it would go in front of the camera, which it eventually did. Uh, and you can see that here. And I used a little bit of uh, bird seed on the uh, riverbed to encourage the quite natural behavior here to try and show uh, uh, these animals in their environment because we see pictures of them floating on the water or pictures of them flying and they're beautifully uh, elegant birds but actually uh, it's nice to show uh, I think a picture of a bird uh, in both of its uh, or, or, uh, or two of its habitats one below water one on the surface and of course they fly as well but it's just a different, a different way of showing these animals in their habitat uh, and their natural behaviour. Um, that went on to be a, um, uh, an award-winning Im image as well. And it was a lucky one. Uh, I hadn't planned to take that image of the swan, but there we go. Set out to photograph grayling and eventually the mallards. I'll come back to the ducks uh, later. But really my mainstream work uh, uh, in, in chalk streams has been to photograph these beautiful fish. Uh, many of you will be familiar with the grayling. I showed it earlier. And I think it's an underappreciated fish I think it's very good from a conservation point of view because they need clean water and well oxygenated water to survive. They thrive in that kind of waters and that's why they thrive in chalk streams. So good, clear, well oxygenated uh, water with uh, good food supply and good habitat. Uh, you'll find these fish there. Uh, and I love this beautiful dorsal fin that they have. Uh, and I've taken a lot of images like this where I'm trying to show their natural behavior. They do this both when they're mating, they display and put this fin up, and uh, also when they're fighting for position in the stream, which is what's happening here. And because I'm feeding them a little bit of food to attract them closer to the camera, uh, the, the bigger fish are trying to uh, adopt the best position uh, to get that food. But they're a beautiful, and as I say, uh, often underappreciated fish. And then there's the other side. I mean, you can show the beautiful side, but if you're going to uh, have images that have impact in conservation, uh, you have to show uh, the not so good side as well. And these are some, again, images I did uh, with the Rivers Trust and with local authorities trying to do a, a working up an anti-littering anti campaign. Uh, because wherever you go near bridges, and th both of these photographs were taken near bridges, uh, there's something about human nature. They think they can throw things into water and that then that's they've absolved their responsibility for it. So you'll see beer cans. And if you look closely at the image on the right, uh, you'll see a green plastic bottle there that's been there for a long time. The beer cans are more recent. And when I first saw these things, I used to my instinct was really to clean everything up, uh, put it in a bag and then drop it in a bin because I hate to see this kind of trash just thrown into rivers. Uh, but actually, I started to uh, realize that uh, I should photograph it before I take it out, and these images can be used to some effect. And it's interesting, and both of these are again on the Anton, a tributary of the test. Uh, the image on the right, uh, in the upper reaches near Andover, it's a bridge, uh, one of the many bridges uh, in Andover. Uh, and it's, it's a really important bit of the water because this is where these very young fish, wild fish here, grayling trout, and there were some roach uh, in there as well. This is where they uh, breed, they grow up. And if you start trashing that environment, of course, the whole, it, it will cascade all the way down. You don't get the adult fish, you don't get the eggs and so on. So I think it, they're quite important images to uh, show. And I think many of you will be familiar with the, this sort of issue. It's just rightly in our faces at the moment, uh, the, the sewage problem. There are all sorts of statistics out there here are some. The image bottom right is not mine. This was by uh, Rob Reed in The Guardian, but it's the kind of image that really turns my stomach and gets me motivated to do ever more work. And these are fish that have died as a result of uh, pollution. Now, I think I alluded to this earlier, but the problem with traditional approaches to underwater photography in rivers uh, with skittish subjects, shallow and turbid water is, and turbid water means I mean, chalk streams always look, people talk about being gin clear, but they're not. You can only see a few metres in reality. So to get quality images, you have to get close 
And the traditional approach that I showed before when I was showing the story about the ducks doesn't always work. So I've used a little bit of imagination and a lot of experimentation to try and uh, work out better ways of photographing river life. And I usually start with sketches like these. So uh, the top sketch here is a just a broom handle was the idea to have a, um, a, a pole cam, as they're called, just with a brake lever, a bit of wire that would operate the shutter of a simple camera on the end of a pole. Uh, bottom right is a rather more sophisticated idea to use radio frequency triggering to lay a camera on the riverbed and then control it uh, with a, a remote shutter, for, but wirelessly. Interestingly, the bottom right one was a complete failure for reasons I won't bore you with. And the simpler um, one at the top was uh, a raging success to start with. Um, so I have a very modest workshop. I call it bike shed engineering. I don't have lathes or anything clever like that. I have a pillar drill is probably the most sophisticated uh, tool that I have. But I do have engineering uh, skills and the two pictures here, the two photographs show the uh, pole cam as it was built. In fact, I used, uh, it's great to recycle things. You might notice a paint roller there became the broom handle and then uh, what had a wire to the shutter and a simple compact camera. So this is not an expensive rig at, uh, at all and mainly made out of recycled parts. And that simple uh, rig uh, I used to take this photograph uh, which uh, won a major award in underwater photography of the year and it just shows and it's a thing I'm all, I teach photography occasionally and I just remind people it's not about a buying expensive gear expensive gear can help if you're doing particular things but it's about imagination experimentation so just dipping a simple uh, camera on the end of a pole and having the imagination to get this upward looking photograph to catch both the duck and the trout in the picture uh, that was on the uh, river test at uh, Stockbridge uh, that I took that picture. But I have some more sophisticated designs and they've come through. I, I sometimes build them myself and occasionally when they get this sophisticated, I ask a colleague who's better with electronics and uh, building uh, specialist housings. He will build the gear for me. And I've used this particular design, which runs to a remote laptop. I've used it uh, effectively for uh, I would say now 80% of my chalk stream work. It's a very, very effective uh, camera specifically designed uh, to work in chalk streams. Uh, but I develop it continuously. This is what it looks like at the moment. So this is a very recent photograph. The business end is on the right. That's the bit that sits in the water with part of it above water, the uh, flashlights and so on, and the camera bit with the dome there below. And then you can run it out on the end of a 10 meter lead to the control station that's shown on the left there, which has a remote laptop giving you a live view. It's got a secondary live view from the GoPro that's on that rig. And then uh, the rest is power supplies really to keep it running all day long. This is just a closer look at the uh, business end of it uh, that sits in the water. Um, and uh, it can be used for video, for stills. I'm mainly a still specialist for documentary work. I do create uh, movies but I'm not really an expert at that. I have colleagues who are far better. And this is all can be wirelessly controlled, but I like to work generally in rivers on a hard connection uh, through a, an ethernet cable, uh, just because you get uh, instantaneous feedback and control. Wireless can be a little bit flaky. And here are two examples in use. Uh, top left, uh, sorry, left hand image is on uh, the River Lockie in Scotland. I was working on a salmon project sadly cut short by covid uh, that was just a few days before the whole covid thing started and i couldn't see that project through and it will take years to get the project back online again uh, and the rig on the right is uh, um, what, uh, being used on a, uh, a chalk stream a very very local uh, chalk stream and i'll just show you some of the other images now that are great so the rainbow trout in the foreground here it's a brown trout in the background the rainbow trout is not a native species, but it's pretty much uh, throughout the River Testament that they've been in our waters for many, many years now. And they're very beautiful looking fish, highly valued by uh, the sports fishing community. And fishermen are a big part of the conservation story. I, I, I used to fish, not so much these days, uh, but uh, I think what fishermen, and I think of Fergal Shark in particular, he's a fisherman. He's doing great things to try and help get the messages out there because he has a particular following. So I think uh, fishermen can be very, very useful in the, in the conservation story and they care for the environment. They really do. 
Um, you'll always meet fishermen who don't uh, look after their environment so well, but many more do in my experience. Uh, these are, it's a mixed school of uh, rainbow and brown trout on the uh, river test at Stockbridge. And this is our native uh, brown trout again at uh, Stockbridge. And I've got a little tiny little stretch there. It's uh, a private land uh, that I have access to uh, where, where a family that own it, uh, they give me a bit of respite from working in public areas. And it, it gives me a lot of time to really get the, the shot set up with the best possible light at the best possible time, because natural light uh, is the major part of this. I do use flash fill light, uh, but uh, to make shots look really natural, you need bright sunlight, as you see in this image. Uh, this image um, I showed earlier, it's uh, probably one of the better ones that I've taken. It's a game from Stockbridge, and this is the one that uh, ended up on a first class stamp uh, last year. And the, the great thing about it is it was a, a whole set of images, I think inspired in part by a lot of the stress that our river systems are coming on. And, and there's a desire here to tell the story about the, our rivers and all the wonderful wildlife surrounding it, uh, from uh, beavers, otters, uh, the insect life, the birds. And I think it was a really good set. Uh, and it does help to get the message. I mean, people collect these things uh, specifically. Uh, but actually, it does help catch the public imagination when they see these uh, images. And certainly in my local village where uh, the, it was well promoted in the uh, uh, post office there, it's amazing how many people came to talk about river images as a result of that uh, particular stamp. And, it, and it's pure luck. I didn't uh, angle to have that image on the stamp. It was just chosen for it. There's another area or place that I work up uh, uh, at uh, Whitchurch um, Silt Mill, uh, I'm sure some of you uh, will know, and I've taken a lot of images there. This was uh, from uh, last year and some of the more recent photographs I've taken of the uh, fish there and, and the beautiful, uh, they really try to manage their environment well there. Now, they have no control over what goes in the water upstream, but some of the fisheries are well looked after. There is certainly a problem with uh, some of the farming runoff creating uh, the brown algae you see here is almost certainly from uh, uh, too much uh, rich nutrients uh, going in. And uh, this is just uh, same place, uh, another image of the uh, uh, wild uh, brown trout. And that's the mill itself. And I think it helps when you're telling the story. These are called the split level images as per the swan one. I don't know what it is about these kind of images. They're very hard technically to produce but worth it uh, in uh, conservation and storytelling. And I think people who don't go underwater readily connect when they can identify immediately with what is above water. And I think the, the silt mill uh, for me provides this beautiful setting uh, where they really look after the environment above and below water. And of course, this weed life is critical uh, to the health of the river because it's uh, where all the insects are uh, breeding and living. And that for bird life and the whole food chain, fish, birds, everything all depend on that insect life. And this is the uh, flowering ranunculus, uh, which really was prolific this year at the silk mill. So I did a whole whole portfolio of images for them uh, that was looking at the uh, ranun ranunculus um, weed, which is an incredibly important part of the habitat. And this is the other side, the upstream side of the uh, silk mill. And it, it, nicely for them, it's got the... Uh, their uh, name and logo there, but it shows uh, the fish below. Uh, it isn't entirely natural behavior, I have to say here. You don't normally get trout schooling like this. Some of you will know it. Um, the fish are normally more solitary. But the reason they aggregate here is uh, that children come and feed the ducks. And when they're feeding the ducks, the trout uh, sort of uh, dash in to get the food as well. And over time, a school of fish has built up there. And I think it looks quite attractive. So, it, it, and I think it's great that children go there and they get interested and, and the silk mill are great at trying to educate people not to feed them bread, which is incredibly damaging for the fish and the environment and the ducks. But, you know, uh, vegetable matter is far better, you know, better to get a pack of frozen peas, I always say, uh, better for the fish or uh, the silk mill supply themselves high protein pellets, uh, which degrade uh, naturally in the environment, those that aren't eaten. But I think these images are great storytelling images, uh, and I've done an awful lot of them with the uh, silk mill. 
But of course, a critical bit of the food chain, and I've mentioned it briefly, it's the insect and invertebrate life. And to photograph that, it's even more difficult in many ways, uh, trying to uh, get focused in on tiny little subjects like this water boatman. Uh, it's a completely different kind of system. Uh, I've tried both uh, static rigs, which, uh, which have not worked so well because these insects are always moving around, uh, handheld and obviously very, very high magnification. Uh, but again, these uh, this I uh, picked up an award in Underwater Photographer of the Year because it's not many people photograph them in the natural environment. But it's a very, very important part of the storytelling of the invertebrates. And here, you, you, most people would know bottom left the uh, caddis fly, uh, a very, very important species in chalk streams. Um, and on the right, uh, the uh, very high magnification, it, that is the midge. Uh, only a few millimetres long of the, uh, I think it's a, a mi uh, sorry, the pupae of a midge, a non-biting uh, midge. And top left, even higher magnification, it's only about the size of a pinhead, uh, that is a water mite. You, you don't, you, it's hard to see them even with the naked eye, let alone get a camera on them, but very occasionally, they're normally very frenetic and racing around, but occasionally they'll rest and, uh, on, and pause and then you can photograph them. But I think this is an amazingly important part of the story. If these, if the stress comes on these creatures and, of course, the weeds that they live in, uh, then the rivers are in trouble. I'm going to go back to the ducks, but this time the grown-up ones. Uh, 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 and when I'm photographing trout, and this is just a topside photo, obviously, it, the moment you put food in the water, it seems to me that every mallard duck within about a 50 mile radius will be on you in about five minutes or so. So I normally have rafts of ducks hanging around the camera. And of course, they're normally, uh, if I've got the camera below water, all you see are duck backsides below water. And it kind of takes your eye away from, in, in an uh, unattractive way, the fish that are underwater. But what I found is if you use sinking food and you uh, are very accurate with where you throw the food, you can get food coming in front of the camera uh, underwater where both the trout and duck will go for it. And I got this rather lovely image and technically it's not a great one. It, uh, it would, ne would never win any awards because the highlights are blown and people who understand photography will pick holes in it. But I think as a, a sort of uh, just an unusual storytelling image, uh, it's very, very good. It has high impact, uh, mainly because of its novelty. Uh, and uh, here's a big rainbow trout and a, a mallard duck chasing the same bit of food. Uh, but actually, this is one of those pictures that the newspaper editors were all over me like a cheap suit for this one. And I sold it to most of the UK newspapers and uh, then it, it went around Europe as well, just because it, it was a bit of a funny image. And I gave it the title Duck Photo Bomb uh, and it really resonated and people just laughed at it. it. It made them smile. But that's a great thing and it's a very powerful thing with an image. And even if the moment passes, you know, some people, if they'll click on this and you have a story that's attached to it about rivers and chalk streams, you find you can get them reading in. So it's clickbait, uh, that, that's all this kind of image is, but actually it's pretty useful if you want to engage the general public and people who might not yet have an interest in our rivers. It's a good, good kind of image to engage with them. And I went on to do a whole series of them, and this was uh, another award winner in an international uh, competition. And it's just unusual, and I just love it that you've got these beautifully colored uh, mallards with uh, that beautiful green and the yellow and the ruddy color on the, the breast there and one of our uh, wild native trout uh, again uh, another from the river anton that beautiful tributary of the uh, river test so I'll, I'll move now on to um, bats and actually there's a very um, serious clear link for me but it's not obvious to many others uh, between uh, river images and this image, one bit of it might be obvious that you can see this bat is taking an insect off the top of the water. But the, re the reason I got onto, into this is this is a Debenton's bat, and I never knew this at the time. But as I was uh, packing up my river photography at dusk one evening, I saw this tiny little bat, almost like a hovercraft, whizzing across the surface of the water and picking mayflies, which the trout were also taking off the surface. And I thought that will be one hell of an image to take. And I imagined a trout below water and a bat above water competing for the same um, fly. Well, it turned out that that was a bridge too far. It was impossible, but it led to, led me uh, to two years work 
trying to work out how to photograph bats in flight at night. And it was a really, really difficult project. And I eventually did get some good images. Uh, and here is the same De Benton's bat. This is a, an image of it having scooped that insect off the water's surface. It then on the wing, remarkably, pushes this insect into its mouth. Well, all bats do this. But uh, this is just one occasion where it happened to turn its head towards the camera. And you can see its feet there. And, and the feet of these particular bats, they're like hobbits. They're bigger and hairier than other bats in order that they can trap the insects from the water's surface. And once I started this project, I, it was hard to let go of it. And I did it formally with the Royal Photographic Society, uh, did it as my fellowship project, and the Bat Conservation Trust, who were particularly interested in how we could photograph bats. Nobody had ever written a proper serious academic paper about it. And I said I would do it as my fellowship uh, project. And I can't bore you with all the detail, but I do want to make clear that this really was a depth study into the physiology of bat uh, sight, because bats, uh, I'm sure some will know, are protected species and you can disturb them with photography and that therefore that will be illegal. So I did a lot of study into how we might best photograph bats or better photograph bats, because a lot of people were already doing this uh, without disturbing them. Uh, and I went into looking at different types of light, infrared in particular, but also low light, low power, normal light, as it were. And I'll just show you, I, I built a series of photo traps here. And again, it's just a bit of imagination. Uh, I hope the video comes across OK on Zoom. Uh, this is me uh, at a local lake called Co Co Cote Water near Swindon, where these uh, a lot of bats fly and the Dobenton's bats fly over water. And I built this uh, a trap. It's, um, there was no such thing out there to do it really, so I, I used a couple of lasers, which I'll describe to you in more detail in a moment, to set just above the water to activate the cameras at night, because this is at dusk. Uh, uh, clearly at night you can't see the bats, uh, particularly on a moonless night, uh, and I found it impossible to use normal photography techniques. So a high speed photo trap, and it has to react very quickly because they fly at speed. Uh, was the uh, what was required and a lot of experimentation I went through 11 different experimental versions of this and eventually I came up with this thing and this is photographed using infrared uh, at night uh, to show uh, the rig uh, in action as it were so this is uh, the camera one of the cameras looking down towards the uh, the trap the laser trap which I'll show you uh, the, the reverse picture at the other end, the bat's eye view, uh, eye view as it flies towards the camera. And the bats don't worry about this, by the way. They navigate so precisely with their echolocation using ultrasound. Uh, they'll whiz in and out of here, no problem at all. It doesn't disturb them. And a great part of learning how this might work was, of course, studying the bats, which I did for three months before I even uh, um, uh, put a camera in the, uh, near the water. This is the other end of the, uh, that trap. So where the red arrow is, uh, that is the camera and the flash gun you were stood behind in the previous image. And in the foreground of this image, you can probably see just below water, there's a, a tripod and a horizontal beam projecting above water, then are two vertical stays. And there are a couple of lasers here. So the laser in the foreground nearest to us and a laser nearer to the camera that's gonna take the picture. And what the laser to the camera, nearest camera does, it fires, this is invisible to the bats and the human eye, apart from little red dots at the receiver and transmitter. It fires this laser beam off some mirrors. These are just mirrors on plasticine. And this creates a grid. Now, through observation, I know the bat is going to fly in this area. And when it goes through this first grid, it will trigger the camera and open it. And then further down, just above the water, where they tend to take the insects off the water, a uh, second laser will fire the flash gun. And it's the flash gun that actually gets the picture. You have to pre-open the camera shutter on a long exposure. It, it's a fairly complicated rig, but I got it working. Uh, it's a, um, it, it takes a lot of looking after on the night, uh, but it worked very, very well indeed in the end. Uh, and I have one particular bat and you can see the shadows as they fly through. You, you can't really follow the action and direct the camera yourself. But you can see what's happening. And there was one bat that used to persistently fly through the rig and never set it off. 
and I dubbed it Tom Cruise. It was a bit like the Mission Impossible thing. And I think it was actually flying in between uh, the initial rig. So it would trigger the flash if it went for an insect, but it wouldn't trigger the camera. Uh, so it was a very frustrating, but I never got a photograph of it uh, to see if there's anything different about it. But I think it was either bad luck or it was a very clever flyer and it could it knew to fly in between the laser beams. I also developed some wide angle rigs. Uh, so that first rig is for taking close up photos, but I wanted some bigger scene pictures. And these are really commercial off shelf components modified uh, with infrared filters and other ideas to try and get uh, these uh, pictures. So uh, and let me just show you some pictures now. So this is from the laser trap and uh, the bat flying through. This is De Benton's bat. They can look fierce and, and people, you know, warn, you know, you don't worry about the teeth and all the rest of it. And, you know, you, some of you may understand that uh, bats can carry rabies. Well, they can. Uh, but um, actually, they're just echolocating. They're not big, fierce creatures. They're tiny little things, they're absolutely gorgeous creatures. And here he's, he's just echolocating. So he's shouting out the ultrasound. And with those lovely big ears, he's listening for the return so he can track the insects. This is a, a wide angle shot. Uh, it's a single bat, but I use a strobe technique here. Rapidly at about uh, 10 times a second, flash uh, a little burst of light to pick the bat out at different stages of flight. So at the left hand edge, you can see it's upside down. And in fact, it's just taken an insect there and then it's correcting its flight path to roll the right way up. And I wanted to show the whole habitat here. So you've got woods, water, you can see insects in the high level, uh, level version, but also there is a conservation story in the background here. It's there are jets flying overhead. These are the early morning jets out of the Heathrow, uh, pushing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, of course, uh, potentially doing uh, damage to the, um, the, the, the whole environment. This is a closer wide angle shot, a slightly narrower camera angle. Uh, again, this strobing technique, and it really shows quite well how the bat dives down onto the water. He brings his feet forward, and then you can, in the high res version, actually see the insect as the bat traps it with those big hobbit uh, feet and then puts it into his uh, mouth. And sometimes you get lucky, and you can't organize shots like this. This is a I forget the type of insect now, but it's uh, one of the big ones, obviously, coming off the water. And uh, De Benton's back here thinking uh, he's got it made. They normally are catching uh, hundreds of thousands of midges per night, uh, but actually it won't take uh, as many of these. I think it's a crane fly uh, um, uh, to, to get a good meal. And this, for me, uh, became a very important image. Uh, this is uh, shows the flight paths of the bat with the infrared trails, and these are the Dementons hunting at night. Uh, but again, trying to show the habitat, the water, the woodland, and you can see the insect on the water. And I was lucky enough to win the British Wildlife Photography Awards uh, with this image in 2018. And the great thing about that is you get uh, winning competitions is great. Uh, of course, it boosts your ego, it inspires you to uh, keep going on. But the main reason for me is that it gets you a profile that gets people talking to you about other projects. And I certainly now, as a result of that image, uh, got to know a lot of the bat community even better than I already did. It was really, really good. Uh, this is uh, an infrared image of uh, um, a bat taking an insect, uh, and it shows both the flight path of the midge and the uh, flight path of the bat. And you can tell it caught it because uh, the flight path of the bat, uh, bat extends beyond the point of insect, but of course the insect's flight path stops. So you can tell it actually caught the insect at a particular point. Uh, and these uh, potentially have some scientific value because I've done lots of these kinds of shots showing uh, the uh, acrobatics of bats as they actually uh, take on an insect in flight. And you'll notice that the insect maneuvers just before it's caught and some insects actually can uh, radiate countermeasures. Uh, moths can do this. Some uh, species of moths, the Druze moth, can actually jam the bat's signal. And uh, there's a little bit of evasion going on there. And this, uh, I'll come back to this image later. Uh, this is a, uh, a pair of bats. Again, it's a strobing technique. They are soprano pipistrels in this case. Uh, and you can see the insect, which is also strobed, uh, um, just about just before the bat catches it 
And you can see that foreground bat, his, his tail is coming forward, his legs are coming forward, and they use that as a scoop uh, to uh, catch the insect. But I became very interested in the uh, background part of the environment here is night, of course. And uh, I was lucky enough, uh, you can uh, say lucky enough, you can actually time your shots at certain times of year to get the shooting stars. It, it's relatively easy to do. And I did catch one in this particular image. And I've done some really artistic work, where, uh, and these are Marmite images. Uh, I imagine about half of you will like this image, half of you will shrug your shoulders and maybe not like it. But it's the same sort of uh, environment, you, the woods and water is there. But by panning the camera during the uh, um, image, and by merging both an infrared and a normal light image, uh, the strobe still freezes the bat at its different stages of flight, but the long exposure on the uh, movement and the movement of the camera, it's a handheld image, uh, you actually get this more artistic effect. But I actually auctioned this uh, um, in, uh, for the Ukraine uh, appeal uh, through the Royal Photographic Society. It was a limited edition of five, and it raised quite a lot of money. So clearly some people did like it well enough. And as I mentioned, the great joy for me uh, creating images like this is uh, people want to come and talk to you about working with them. Uh, this is my local uh, back group. I've done a lot of work with them since uh, in uh, Wiltshire. And I've documented them doing their uh, day work where they go and look at bat roosts. And this is clearly licensed work. They are protected species. And there's a little group of, I think they're naturalist bats there in one of the bat boxes. And they're doing all the science around them. And this is a whiskered bat. And again, uh, people worry about them looking fierce with the sharp teeth. Uh, that is somebody's thumb there. These are tiny little creatures. I think they're absolutely uh, amazing. And the joy for me is I'm now able to see close up under licensed activity uh, and, and actually photograph and help these groups with these images. And I'm actually able to see what it is I've been photographing previously in flight. And I had, I'll tell you one final story with the bats. Uh, I got a chance to go out uh, with the group, the Wiltshire bat group, when they were radio tracking a very elusive and rare bat. So they trapped the bat at night uh, and then put a tiny radio tag on it, weighs about two grams. And through normal um, cleaning processes, uh, uh, the, the, the bat will actually scratch the radio transmitter off within two days. But whilst it's on, they try and work out where the roost is. And we did that. And it was a barber style bat. They are uh, stealthy, very fast bats, uh, moth specialists. They're extinct already in some European countries and a little bit on the edge in this country, which is why it's important to study them. And I have a video infrared video capability and a very long lens. So I'm stood well back from the roost here. And this is where you must not disturb them at the roost and was very lucky. Uh, we, we knew exactly where in the oak tree this is a split in a beam of an oak tree, these bats were. And you can just see the little eyes of the bat looking out there. And I'll run a video here and it will show you a female barmistel coming out of the roost with its pup attached to it. Now, it's not particularly clear video because of the frame rate, but there is a slow-mo and a freeze frame. And I hope that will come across. Uh, but this is a, a very important bit of the bat's behavior that I'll explain in a moment. So that's normal speed. Here is the slow-mo. You may see a shadow, it's just hanging below the bat there. If not, don't worry. I know zoom's a bit difficult sometimes, but this will freeze frame now, and I'll leave that up long enough for you to see what's happening. So you might just break out. So this is the, the mother and her wings here. This little thing here that I'm running the cursor around, and the shadow shows really quite well here. These are the hind legs of the baby bat. It's the size of a small coin. And uh, this is an anti-predation strategy, not often filmed. So barbastels will move their roosts regularly. They have uh, several roosts. Uh, this was in Savanac Forest. And to uh, or owls, when they work out where a roost is and other birds of prey, will, will stake the roost out and jump on the uh, uh, bats as they just as they come out of their roost. So to try and lessen the chances of that happening, uh, the females will move their pups between roosts regularly. And we just happened to be lucky this night. So a really interesting uh, bit of behavior. Uh, this is one of my favorite uh, bats. It's the brown uh, long-eared bat. Uh, it was uh, photographed, uh, I've got these in my own garden, uh, but this one was photographed at a, a chalk mine in uh, Surrey.
and uh, I've got I've been lucky enough. Uh, I'm moving off British bats and, and just showing the, how this rattles on. It's great to work with conservation groups through the Wiltshire Group. I managed to contact uh, or people contacted me. Uh, this was a non-government organisation in Romania. They have amazing habitat there. Really ancient, a lot of ancient woodland, not yet felled, although there's a lot of pressure on it. Deep limestone caves. And interestingly, buildings, this is a really good commentary about the use of buildings, churches in particular, where bats, a lot of bats roost, and they do in this country. I think the churches are getting much better in this country now at uh, not seeing bats as pests because they can do damage, uh, but as a resource. But in Romania, they also have a lot of disused buildings that they have, if they have bat roosts, they don't just leave them the bats there. They will actually improve the disused building, not for personal habitation, uh, but in order um, you know, to have a better looking, let's say, uh, uh, unused uh, house in a village. A mayor will happily uh, have it as a bat, bat roost. Unlike in this country where we tend to almost want to use every disused building either gets knocked down or becomes a new property. And there are, I'm afraid uh, it's just life. A lot of unscrupulous property, property developers uh, will try and get around the law that says you cannot knock down a building that's got bats in. In Romania, they absolutely live with the bats and it's extraordinary. It's really good. So I've seen big colonies. This is a disused building on which the local mayor repaired the roof. He got some money from the conservation agency to help. So it's a win-win situation. And a bat that's very rare in this country, horseshoe bats, uh, actually flourishing by the thousand out in uh, Romania. And I'll just show you a little bit of uh, infrared image here of this roost. And I, I, I think it's remarkable that, uh, you know, they don't uh, either knock down or redevelop absolutely everything that they've got. They're happy to live alongside wildlife that, uh, and cohabit with it in a way. And we could learn something from that. And a bat that's almost extinct in this country, there's probably one, maybe two individuals left in the country. These are mouse-eared bats. Again, uh, thousands of them there. Uh, this is in the roof of a church. And uh, you can see that there are pups top left. I don't know if you can see my cursor. This is a baby uh, suckling. And uh, the, uh, this is again licensed work going in the, to count the bats uh, and check the uh, health of them. And I was doing this with the NGO. And we also went to the main roost uh, deep underground into the limestone caves, uh, which was absolutely uh, fascinating. And if I look slightly uh, nervous in this image, it's because I was slightly nervous. I'm not uh, uh, averse to a little bit of uh, adventurous activity. It's just my knees are getting quite old. Uh, uh, or they feel old uh, they're getting quite creaky and uh, uh, any old fool can sort of have sailed down a rope but uh, you had to climb back up under your own power and that was a bit of a challenge for me but well worth it to see this kind of site and i think we counted eight thousand bats in this site of different species and through these photographs we were able to count both count and identify the uh, bats and they don't have a massive artistic value uh, per se but th this is a uh, true conservation work but I was allowed to, uh, they let me loose to do some more artistic work. This is a mouse-eared bat uh, coming out of the roost. And I just want to uh, conclude as a footnote, so I'm almost uh, finished now and then we'll go on to questions, but it, it's an interesting development for me uh, that when I started taking this kind of photograph, um, I sort of naturally end up segueing from taking photographs in deep caves in Romania out into deep space because th th these backgrounds really interested me the astro backgrounds the beautiful night sky so I, i've uh, been out in egypt for example where i've done a lot of underwater work uh, and uh, recently went out to oregon uh, and took s some s milky way pictures you'll be familiar uh, with these kind of pictures i'm sure but i thought they're quite important uh, i want to get a quality background in some, some of my bat images so, but I also became fascinated what was out there in deep space. So um, I uh, am lucky in that my brother who lives in Spain, who, who's uh, very good with engineering, uh, between us, we've designed and built um, a, a telescope. Now, you might think, what has this got to do with conservation? For me, it's just an extension of the natural world. It's extreme extension by looking out into uh, deep space. And I've put a, a modest telescope in this little, it's just two meter square um, uh, building with a, a, an automated rolling roof. 
uh, that I can control right from the computer I'm looking at now in uh, UK. But the reason it's out there is they have clear skies so you can look into space far more often. And this is uh, the software on my computer and uh, a little infrared camera inside the observatory uh, that I can make sure everything's working okay. Uh, I've been able to take some really interesting pictures. So that bat picture, uh, for those of you that know the night sky, um, if you, I'm just zooming in now, so it'll look a little bit blurry. But that formation of stars in the background, somebody will be shouting out already, it's Orion. Uh, the, the three horizon, more horizontal stars uh, are Orion's belt and the three more, more towards vertical stars are Orion's sword. But what you uh, may not know is that center star is not in fact a star, it's a nebula. You can see it with the uh, eye. And I became ever for, more fascinated with what it was, so started putting more powerful cameras onto it in the form of a telescope. And that is what it is, it's, that is the Orion Nebula. And as with all the projects I've ended up doing, I just got, my fingers just got deeper and deeper into the mangle of this, but it is part of our natural world. It just, it's looking out into the universe. And I'm not gonna show you a whole lot of this, I'll just show you a galaxy as well uh, that sits up in the region of the uh, plough. In fact, there are several galaxies in this image, but it came out of lockdown. This is when I got trapped, all my projects, wildlife projects, were cancelled. So I first started using a telescope in my back garden while we were restricted. And this is where it rapidly took me to looking into deep space. Uh, so that's it, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to stop rambling at, the, at that point and, and ask you if you have any questions.